This is going to finish up 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look at more enemies of Bible believers. So 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So John says it is the last time, and like I said before, in 1 John, you get a lot of double application. We get church age stuff and also things for the tribulation. Paul also talked about the last days in his epistles. And when he talks about it, he's talking about the last days of the church age. But John talks about the last time for a tribulation saint. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now listen to this. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but whom also he made the world. So the last days started when Jesus Christ was on earth in his earthly ministry, but after the Jews rejected him, these days were these last days were postponed and begin back up again at the end of the church age. So the last time is considered Jesus' earthly ministry. Then they're postponed during the church age. Then the tribulation starts up the last days again with it ending at the millennial reign. And Paul talks about the last days, which I believe is the last days of the church age that we're in now. And then 2 Timothy 3, one, Paul says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And I believe we're in the last days of the church age right now. But an enemy of a Bible believer is time wasters, time killers, and distractions. If perilous times are here, then we don't have time to waste. Even the devil will know he hath but a short time. And John's here in 1 John 2.18 saying, Little children, it is the last time. So uh, one of your enemies is a time waster, time killers, distractions, uh, binge watching Game of Thrones and gaming on Fortnite every day and going to watch Netflix and chill as they say. These are all time wasters and much of the time wasters people do today are ungodly in and of themselves. When a couple goes home to watch Netflix and chill, as they say, they miss most of the movie. And when people play Fortnite, they are simulating murder. When people watch Game of Thrones, they are setting unclean things before their eyes. These are time wasters. The devil redeems his time by making you waste your time. He knows he hath but a short time, so he wants you to waste your time. But who's the next enemy we can look at? In 1 John 2.18, he says, There are many antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. This enemy is the antichrist. Now, as, we, as we're born-again Bible believers in the church age, we're not going to see the antichrist. But even now... There are many antichrists. Who is an antichrist? If you go down in a few verses, John will let you know in 1 John 2, 22 and 23, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So anyone who denies that Jesus Christ is God is an antichrist. They just aren't the antichrist. Just like there is one devil but many devils, there's one antichrist. There's one the antichrist, but there's many antichrists. And the antichrist is going to show up in the time of Jacob's trouble. He will sit in the temple of God, claiming to be God. And this is called the abomination of desolation. Spoken of in Matthew twenty four fifteen and Daniel eleven twenty one, and Daniel eleven twenty one tells us this man comes in peaceably, and obtains 
obtains the kingdom by flatteries. Watch out for a man who only wants to flatter you because he could be an enemy. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 calls him the man of sin and the son of perdition. But the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. You don't have to look far to see it. But 1 John 2, 24 says, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So what have you heard from the beginning? If you look all the way back in 1 John 2, 7, it says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye had heard, which ye have heard from the beginning. So remember, that commandment was about loving your brother. And John says to let this remain in you, and you will continue in the Son and in the Father. And Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Looking at this for our practical application, you could say if we continue keeping that commandment, then we're going to be less likely to stray out of fellowship. Fellowship and accountability with other believers will help keep you living a holy life. 1 John 2.25 says, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. If you have eternal life today and lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal to begin with. When you got saved, you got eternal life because the one who is eternal gave you a spotless record and put you into the body of Christ who himself is eternal. Jesus is eternal because he doesn't have a beginning or an ending. You also got everlasting life because while you didn't exist before your birth, you will now never die since you have been born again. 1 John 2.26 these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. So this brings us to our, another enemy, seducers. Second Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The serpent likes to beguile, and he's subtle. He's a seducer. The devil and his henchmen are subtle because they appear as angels of light and ministers of righteousness. And Romans 16, 18 says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And Paul said, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Uh, false teachers will seduce you with a cool new doctrine or preaching a positive message. They'll teach something like you're saved by grace, so just sin as much as you want to. Uh, they promise you liberty, but bring you back into the bondage of the flesh. And Second Peter two eighteen and 19 says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Seducers give you a corrupt Jesus Christ that's cool and hip and acceptable to the world. A Jesus Christ that's far from the Bible, a Jesus Christ that's not God in the flesh, that's who they give you. And how do you prepare yourself against seducers? Read what the Bible says here in the chapter we're studying. In 1 John two twenty six and 27, John says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you, teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. The anointing is the unction back up there a few verses. And First John 2.20 says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, 
and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus, Jesus is the Christ, he is any Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. So the anointing is the unction. And if you read this book and you're saved and you let the Holy Spirit guide you into the truth, then you don't have to worry about deceivers and seducers and any Christ so much because you have an anointing, an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. You're not going to be as deceived as someone who's not in the book. When it says you know all things, that doesn't mean you don't need a teacher anymore or you just know everything about the Bible. But, I mean, you're going to have some sense when a, a false teacher, an antichrist, with the antichrist spirit comes. You're not as likely to be deceived. So, 1 John two twenty seven. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. It says, ye need not that any man teach you. In Ephesians 4.11, Paul talks about how the Lord gave us pastors and teachers. But when it comes right down to it, we always take what the teacher says and make sure it lines up with the book. Let a man teach you, but let the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures only, be the final authority. And then, if your teacher turns out to be an antichrist, and what he says is side by side with the Bible... You take what the Bible says over what he says. But hopefully what your teacher says is matching with what the Bible says. 1 John 2.28 says, And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. This can go for the born-again believer at the rapture of the church, and even for the tribulation saint at the rapture of the tribulation saints. And if you're abiding in Him, then you're in prayer, and you're in the book, and you're doing what He says. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you want to be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to your Christian walk. You're already blameless when it comes to the new man inside of you, the, the spirit. First John two twenty eight says, And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know when you have a test coming up and you don't study the day of the test you have absolutely zero confidence in what you're doing. If you don't strive to do right before the Lord comes, then you're not going to be confident at the judgment seat of Christ when it comes to your Christian service. And the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with our salvation. It's about our rewards and, you know, our Christian service. What have you done for Jesus Christ? And notice that word ashamed there in verse 28. You're going to be ashamed at His coming if you're still doing the things you did as a lost man Romans 6.21 says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When it comes to salvation, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you won't be ashamed in that aspect that is coming. Because it says in Romans ten eleven, for what say for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, but how you did in your Christian walk is something else entirely. Are you going to be ashamed with how you lived as a Christian at his coming? And first John two twenty nine says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. And remember, only a true born again Christian can work righteousness. A lost person may do some good things, but it never counts for anything. It doesn't count for his salvation. And yet he doesn't get any rewards for it. But a Christian can do righteousness because the thing, the thing is, what's in him is what's making it possible for him to work righteousness because it's the Lord in them allowing them to work righteousness and that person is 
allowing the Lord to work righteousness through them. So really only a righteous person who's born again can work righteousness. A lost man can do good things, but you know, it's not considered righteous. For there is none righteous, no, not one. And the only righteousness I have was imputed to me. At the moment of salvation, I got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But this is the end of 1 John chapter 2.